Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll also be your host for today. This webinar is part of our program of bioinformatics training that creates opportunities for the Australian life science community to develop transferable skills in bioinformatics and to learn how to use new platforms, tools, services and techniques. You can keep up to date with the latest BioCommons news and events using the links that you can see on your screen. To begin the webinar, we will take a moment to pause and acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today, our team is joining you from a wide variety of places from across the country, and I am joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people in the Anjan of Brisbane. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I'm now going to hand over to Ziad to introduce today's topic and our panel of guests. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone, for attending. So we are here today to talk about ABLES, the Australian Biocommon Leadership Share. ABLES was established by the Australian Biocommons and it aims to provide fully subsidized access to compute resources and specialized expertise to support life science researchers. And in this webinar, we'll be talking about the structure of the program, uh, the progress in the past two years, but we also will hear from three different speakers from ABLES communities that will talk about their use case and their work that was supported by ABLES. Next, please. From ABLES team, we have uh, me, or, and I am bioinform bioinformatics application specialist at the Australian Biocommons. Uh, we also have Dr. Johan Gustafsson, who is bioinformatics engagement officer from the Australian Biocommons, and Dr. Steven Manos, who is the associate director of the BioCloud team that leads the ABLES program. From the community, we have three speakers. We have Dr. Pardib battle from the National Center for uh, Indigenous Genomics from the National uh, from the Australian National University. We have Chelsea Mayo from Children's Cancer Institutes and Theodore Arnold from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. And from now, I will hand it over to Johan and we'll come back to you after this. Thanks, Ziad. Um, so I wanted to start with um, a very brief introduction to the Biocommons um, and um, how we got to the ABLES program. Um, so the Biocommons uh, is funded by ENCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia. Uh, we were established in 2019 with a mission to actively support Australian life science research communities with bioinformatics and bioscience data infrastructure and specifically to do so at a national um, scale. The way that we do this is that we facilitate uh, interactions with computational providers um, to build a more fit for purpose, flexible and cohesive data analysis ecosystem based on requirements sourced directly from um, our communities. How do we work out what it is that these communities need? We engage and consult with those communities. So we will identify a community, we will research and consult with them. Um, we will try and then distill their requirements and their challenges uh, and produce a document that outlines um, what the blockers are um, uh, for, for the for specific life science domains. We then move into a deployment phase um, and it's in this deployment phase that we will partner uh, with infrastructures um, to try and either align to existing solutions, adopt existing solutions for the Australian context, or when necessary, actually create new things that fill gaps um, in Australian life science research infrastructure. Uh, on this slide, you can see some examples of services which um, either exist right now or are being developed by the Biocommons and our partners. And it includes things like Galaxy Australia, um, FGENES H um, and the Australian Reference Genome Atlas. One of the things that we have noticed um, in terms of cross-cutting themes uh, for our life science communities is that as um, bioinformatics, as uh, data-intensive life science progresses, 
Um, not only is it becoming more complex, you're having larger data sets, um, larger sample sets that need to be analyzed. Um, there are several key themes here. First is that bioinformatics compute use is episodic in nature. Um, so we're looking at multi-year timeframes that are dependent on collaborations. And unlike other domains, the compute is simply not needed at all times. Uh, one of the drivers for this, of course, is that compute use is driven by data availability. Um, biology is complex, it's unpredictable, um, and both biology and um, experiments do not respect timetables, and that means that the compute use doesn't either. Um, software is also diverse, um, so it, it's imported, it's complex, it will rapidly evolve, it's multi-language, um, and in most cases isn't optimized for um, peak computational facilities like high-performance um, high performance computers. And finally, um, a key observation was that in order to accelerate a move of life science to bigger systems, because they require the scale, um, you actually need various types of expertise and effective coordination. Um, so one of the big blockers to taking a bioinformatics approach from a local system or a local cluster to national facilities um, is simply that that entire ecosystem is opaque if you've not been involved with it before. Um, and so if you have a community or a program that can actually promote, support and coordinate collaborative effort, it makes it a lot easier to onboard less experienced researchers, less experienced research software engineers, and therefore accelerate a transition. So summarizing the researcher requirements based on those cross-cutting observations, um, we're looking at a requirement for easy access to compute infrastructure and to scalable compute infrastructure, access that has to be uh, for the longer term, and that has to include easy access to tools and pipelines, or at least easy access to mechanisms that are providing those tools and pipelines, and documentation support that actually underpin um, all, all of the above. Uh, so the cumulative sum of these observations and these consultations with, with the community um, are what led to um, the Australian Biocommons Leadership Share. Um, at its core, it is a partnership between the Australian Biocommons, Bioplatforms Australia, the National Computational Infrastructure in Canberra and Pawsey Supercomputing Centre in Perth. Um, to establish a program that provisions allocation, provides expertise to onboard and effectively use um, these peak computational systems, and establishes guidelines and a, um, um, a pathway for actually sharing uh, the outcomes of work that happens on these systems. Um, so a shorthand way of saying that would basically be once a problem is solved, it should stay solved and the next person who comes along shouldn't have to be going through the same pain um, that previous people did to establish something. Around that core of what is being provided in practice, um, the ABLES program has three aspects. Um, so in practice, uh, at a facility like NCI or at Pawsey, what this means is that these would these would be projects that you access. The first one is uh, reference projects, and these are specifically designed to provide the space for life science researchers and communities to create reference data that is of enduring value to the rest of the life science community. Really good example here is uh, genome assemblies. Um, production type projects, um, they are there to accommodate uh, a transition to production where a group or a facility or an institute has uh, best practice software or workflows already available. And what's missing is that ability to scale to either more samples or larger data sets um, requiring something like HPC. And finally, we've got the software accelerator. Uh, the Software Accelerator is a space um, dedicated to bringing bioinformatics software to HPC, optimizing it, benchmarking it, um, making it reusable, and then sharing that with the rest of the community. So it's really then designed to um, accelerate the uptake of bioinformatics um, in, onto HPC systems. Um, and as you might guess, that may then also be a lead-in to doing things like 
production projects or, um, or reference projects. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to uh, Ziad, who's going to take us through some more of the details um, of the um, ABLES program. Thank you, Johan. So in this part of the presentation, uh, I will be talking about ABLES resources and the progress of the program in the past two years. ABLES support includes access to fully subsidized build infrastructure. We have, we have agreements with BOSI and NCI that allow us to use dedicated resources for ABLES users. And this users, these resources will be, will, be, will be given to, the, to, to all ABLES users uh, to work on different analysis. Our agreements include access to 16 million service units on NCI infrastructure and 10 million service units on POSI. And both agreements and resources are renewed every year. In addition to that, the users can have access to a centrally supported uh, uh, repository for tools or like popular tools in bioinformatics. These repositories include workflows, containers, and some databases. And these centrally supported repositories are available on both infrastructures and maintained by, by, by POSI and NCI. In addition to that, we have the Australian BioCommon shared tools and workflow repository that's mainly on NCI, as NCI was our first infrastructure we start working on with, with ABLES. And on this, on this repository, we have a comprehensive set of, of tools, workflows, and databases. And this, this repository is available not only to ABLES users, but to all users at NCI. And ABLES community is the main contributor to this repository. And we, we encouraged all the users, instead of having the tools or workflows uh, within their local projects to deploy them in this repository, then they become available to everyone, which will avoid replicating efforts and, and storage. Also, all users of ABLES will have access to specialized expertise. That includes ABLES team, but also the support from the help desk at NCI and POSI. And the specialized expertise will support the ABLES with, with different, different, different problems, including managing their locations, doing any changes to the projects, and uh, uh, optimizing maybe some technical challenges, as well as like some recommendations on best practice for utilizing the HPC. In more details, we have different allocations for different projects. And considering the three, the three, the three schemes Johan uh, uh, mentioned, we have the reference data, the production bioinformatics, and software accelerators. Accelerator. And we can have these projects in any infrastructure. It depends on the user's requirements. And the resources can be used to access the HPC and the cloud on both infrastructures. We have temporary storage for each project uh, that includes five terabyte. Uh, five terab one terabyte for software accelerator, five terabytes for the production by informatics and the reference data. Uh, POSI has different different systems, so they allow on this temporary storage unlimited unlimited uh, storage for the users. And usually this storage is for a short time and the data there is not packed and will be deleted between one month to three months, depends on the infrastructure policies. Uh, the projects also have access to like long term project uh, long long term storage that is limited uh, as long as the project is active on the infrastructure and we provide also five terabyte storage in both infrastructures uh, for for the production bioinformatics and the reference data but one terabyte for the software accelerator we also provide default service units for each project, starting from 10,000 service units to 100 service units. And these are added by default at the beginning of each quarter are renewed for each ABLES uh, project that's active. And this project will be supported uh, ongoing as long as ABLES exists for the production bioinformatics and the reference data. But the software accelerator is limited to six to 12 months as we believe this kind of project is, is focusing on some specific development that will be limited with time. All, all users can have access to the specialized support and all these projects can have additional resources if needed. 
And the differences between the different allocations is mainly because these projects have different, different requirements. And we have a few expectations of Apple's users. And the main, the main purpose of these expectations is mainly to improve, to improve the program, uh, but also to make you know, the best use of the available resources. The main purpose of Ables is to accelerate and facilitate uh, the research in life science. And therefore, sharing is a key element in the program. We encourage all Ables users uh, to, share, to share outcomes that includes reference data, uh, uh, analyzed data, softwares, databases, knowledge, publications that can benefit the broader bioinformatics communities. <clears throat> We also expect that the project has their own leadership. So they lead the project, they lead the location, they, they manage the membership within the project as they know the users, and they represent like a contact point for us where they communicate their users' needs and we try to help them with, with, with whatever they need. We also expect a community level expertise. So Ables projects or the users within these projects are responsible to do their analysis and we are here to help them and support them with everything we can to facilitate their work. We also expect appropriate use of the resources. Our resources are limited, as I explained at the beginning, and we try to use them in the best possible way. Hopefully, we serve a large number of the researchers. So we expect the users to apply best practices, try to avoid uh, uh, over allocations or anything that can cause any waste of, of the resources, especially that this is also one thing is they are limited, the other thing can't be rolled into other quarters. So whatever is unused within a quarter will not be able to use again. We also expect the communities to support Ables growth. And, and this webinar is an example of this collaboration between us as Ables team, but also the users uh, 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 and the leaders of Ables project where they are here presenting their work and uh, showing you know, their experience with this project. And the other thing is actually was the shared tools, uh, the shared repositories for work for, for tools and workflows, where the main contributor to this repository were Apple's users. We also expect the users to follow the compute facilities access policies. At the end of the day, these users will be onboarded to these systems and they have to adhere to all their policies. And the final thing is that we expect setting and acknowledging able support for any outcome of these projects. So Ebis was established in, in, in uh, 2021, late 2021. And by today we have 24 uh, uh, Ables participants. We have projects on Ables. That includes more than 148 users from different institutes, including 25 who have active projects on Ables. The community, uh, uh, the community of Ables have installed and deployed more than 120 tools and workflows on the shared tools and workflow repository. We provide around 6.5 million service units each quarter, and we provided more than 110 terabytes of storage for all these users. Here is a list of some of the institutions that utilized a and benefits from it. And in some situation, one institution will have multiple projects in case their work is independent. And some projects actually just a collaboration of users from different institutions. And you can see a lot of uh, Australian universities and medical research institutes. And in the last part of this webinar, we will hear from some specific use cases that utilize ABLES. And that include three different projects, the Australian Amphibian and Reptile Genomics, uh, framework initiatives and Dr. Hardy Peter will talk about it. Then we'll have some, <clears throat> we'll have uh, another uh, talk from about the Zero Childhood Project uh, from Chelsea Mayo. And uh, lastly, Theo will be talking about the work related to the genomic for Australian plants. And from here, I will hand over to Hardy. Thank you. Cool. Uh, so uh, my name is Hardy. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Canberra uh, region, the Northern Rambi people on whose unceded land that I'm dialing in from, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So uh, today I'll be sharing some of my experiences uh, as a 
collective of uh, the Ozark project uh, uh, around how we have utilized tables resources. Uh, this is uh, just a brief overview of where we sit in terms of genomics in Australia. And uh, so uh, there are estimated about 2 million eukaryotic species with Australia home to about 10% of the species. And uh, this diversity presents a vast opportunity for scientific exploration and understanding. And as we all know that significant reductions in sequencing cost brings the, makes it really feasible to considering uh, sequencing genomes of all of these eukaryotic species. And essentially, if it moves, sequence it. And if it doesn't sequence it and know why, it doesn't move. So this task is uh, being undertaken by various projects worldwide. There is vertebrate genome project, butterfly projects, and Darwin Tree of Life. And in Australia, through bioplatforms initiatives, uh, there is uh, Ozark, which is uh, taking care of the reptile and amphibian species. And uh, Oz mammals uh, is one of them. There is plants and insects as well. So these are all uh, roughly loosely connected with a large project called Earth Biogenome Project as well uh, to document the genomes of uh, all things living. So it is monumental in effort uh, at a global scale. And it has, uh, it's not just for fun that we do sequence these genomes, it has practical implications for tackling uh, uh, complex questions in biology and ecosystem management. So Ozark uh, is uh, here in, uh, it was initiated uh, three, uh, almost three and a half years back uh, to generate genomic resources for amphibians and reptiles of Australia. It's a platforms funded initiative. And it started with around 25 species to be sequenced with direct funds from bio platforms. But along with that, uh, many researchers have also sequenced uh, associated species that are important to the biological questions that they are interested in. And uh, it is a large collaborative network, spans multiple institutes across Australia. And uh, when the project started, it was known upfront that most projects will, most researchers or most research projects will face similar challenges and opportunities to generate genomic resources. So to touch briefly about our work under the ABLES umbrella at NCI, uh, with Ozark, uh, roughly we estimate that uh, each genome that we sequence uh, generates about five terabytes of data per species. Uh, this is a lower bound estimate. Like of course, that when we are in the project space, there is a, large amount of intermediate files created. But uh, so the way we go about managing this under uh, the Ozark umbrella is we try to reduce redundancy in data storage by efficiently managing the data and uh, through databases. So uh, people don't have multiple copies of the same file. We also uh, try to efficiently remove temporary and intermediate files as and when they are not necessary and also achieve uh, archive important files. Uh, each species generally requires large compute resources. Our estimate is about 200,000 CPU hours. So that will equate to about 400,000 service units per species in general. And uh, it is quite hefty if we were to sequence, for example, all 10,000 species of Australia uh, vertebrate species. It is quite hefty requirement. So what we needed to do was develop QC steps to, uh, to avoid unnecessary compute. For example, if the data is not good quality, don't spend too much time computing unnecessary things on it. And uh, there is also many softwares that uh, do have uh, overlapping output. So we try to uh, analyze the output of each software and the requirement and go back to first principles, uh, essentially, remove any duplicated steps and optimize our workflows to so that they are amenable to scalability. Uh, and uh, as you had mentioned, uh, the software uh, landscape is very different in bioinformatics, biology. Uh, there are dockers and containers largely available for many of the modern softwares. Uh, so we try to utilize them. And it's not my first reference, but we have to do it because a lot of this uh, software uh, have multiple uh, software dependencies in a really complicated way. 
So it makes it easy to use Dockers and containers, which is available at NCI. And of course, like we have, we actively contribute to the shared software repository. And these are all the various softwares that we have installed or manage at various levels. And uh, these are available for the entire research community. So that's my quick update on what we do. And I'll hand it over to Chelsea now. Okay, thank you very much, Hadi, and thanks to Ables for not only supporting your work, but hosting this webinar today. So I'm going to talk to you about the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, but in particular, the transcriptomics analysis and how we use Ables to do this for every single patient. So the Zero Childhood Cancer Program is Australia's most comprehensive precision medicine program for children with cancer. We have recently opened up to every single child in Australia, regardless of disease stage. So we're looking at about a thousand children per year. We are open across all nine pediatric hospitals all across the country. We partner with 22 different research partners and through the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, we run it as a clinical trial, but we're also able to open up novel clinical trials for novel drugs to help treat the children based on their molecular aberrations that are found. So to date, we've just finished closing our PRISM clinical trial, which looked at only the high risk children in Australia. So that was for children that had really high risk disease. They had less than 30% chance of survival. So these are patients that either came to us at diagnosis, predominantly in brain tumors, where they really had no option. They don't um, respond to any sort of treatment that is available, or we get children predominantly in sarcomas, leukemias, lymphomas, or neoblastoma, where they've had treatment before and it just either hasn't worked or they've come back and relapsed. They've got, um, they have no other treatment options available to them. This was such a success that we then put in to say, well, let's, why don't we try to do this for all children? So we recently in the last four months opened to all children across Australia, regardless of the risk profiles, and we've already done 508 patients to date. So this means that no matter what cancer you have, it means you can now be eligible for this trial function at the age of 21. And what we're trying to do now is really look at, well, can we find these patients at diagnosis that are going to relapse before they become high risk? So to do this, we had to set up basically a really big program. So we have to collect all the clinical data. So we work in close collaboration with our clinicians. But importantly, the crux of the program is our genomic data. So we do whole genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, as well as methylation. We analyze it all together. We look for the genetic variants, what is causing their disease, whether it be cancer diagnosis, prognosis, and then also what can be treatable. So what treatment options we do have available to these children. We report that back at a national molecular tumor board, back to the clinicians to say, this is what we believe is driving their disease. And this is what we believe can actually be a treatment. So they don't have to go undergo high rounds of intense chemotherapy if possible. We do have another extension to the program, which is where the biological modeling data comes in, where we actually take a patient's tumor sample injected into mycenographs, where we then test potential treatment options to see, is there something that will actually target this? And then we also grow them up in petri dishes to see, we've got a drug library about of 150 to 660 drugs. Will any of these drugs work? But I'm not going to talk about that side, obviously. So as of today, or earlier, sorry, this month, we have sequenced just under 1,500 unique patients. We're actually also going to do patients um, if they relapse. So if we get a patient at diagnosis, they come back and relapse. We're also going to sequence them as well, see how it's, the tumor has changed and evolved and if there's other treatment options available. So to do this, I lead the RNA sequencing, so the transcriptomic, transcriptomic arm of zero. And so we had to develop this pipeline. And a lot of precision medicine programs, they just look for what are called fusions, so where two genes come together. Um, but what we said is, well, we can do more than that. So we developed this program, it's called Carbonite. And I've got a wonderful research engineer, Angela, who helps put this all together as well. But basically this is our pipeline in a nutshell. Um, on NCI, it takes about 300 SU per patient and we do about 20 patients now per week. And what's really great about this is we've got our input over here on the left in the gray, and it feeds through this entire web. And at the end, we just get a whole bunch of different outputs to get understand the different types of molecular aberrations that a patient can see. All the circles in kind of this teal color, they're all the different algorithms that we use and how they interweave together. But essentially, for those that understand molecular biology, um, we look for fusion structural rearrangements, your single nucleotide changes, your small insertions and deletions. 
We look for how genes expression are changed, so elevated or lost, the different ways they can be changed, so um, specific exons spliced in or out. Transposable elements, so little elements in our genome, this sounds kind of creepy, but where they actually jump around a bit but can cause deleterious disease. And then immunoprofiling for anyone that's heard of immunotherapy as a new and novel option for kids. Basically, back to the algorithm now is the thing that we've done is we've made this compatible to two different human genome references. Used to be HG19, and we've obviously had to since upgrade to the latest one, which is HG38. We aren't quite at the telomere to telomere yet, but this pipeline can run regardless of what human genome reference build. We can actually also run this on mouse. So if anyone does look at um, mice tumors, we can do that as well. Um, so through this pipeline, we have officially seen more than 1,200 patient samples. We've developed it in common workflow lang language, but we've now recently moved it to Nextflow and are running it on Nextflow Tower. So that's the pipeline and how we use NCI, but it's beyond just processing every single patient every week because we have to always continue our research and development to ultimately improve patient care because we have this unique resource where we're collecting about 20 patients per week, which is the largest comprehensive resource to date actually globally for pediatric cancer because we need to constantly improve our outcome for these novel therapies to children, identify different novel mechanisms that are driving their disease to ultimately provide targeted treatment options. So constantly through this program, we're actually able to take this data and not just run the patients, but we're constantly improving our pipeline, adding new algorithms that can find different modalities of the data. For example, we just rolled out an immunoprofiling in pediatric cancer, which has led to a brand new clinical trial. Um, and so that's been rolled into the algorithm. So that's all been processed back into that big web of programs that you saw. We're using it to help provide more molecular diagnostic classifications, especially since a lot of pediatric cancers are quite rare and pathologists look at it and it doesn't quite fit what is currently known. And then also different ways of interpreting the data so we can get better, more accurate ideas behind what this particular um, molecular aberration is doing and how we can target it better to have a better success. So it's obviously a huge program. So lots of people that are involved, but I will end there and I will pass over to Theo. Okay, uh, so my name is Theo Olnut. Um, I'm a bioinformatician from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria, and uh, I'm speaking today from Geelong, the lands of the Wadawurrung people, and uh, I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So the Genomics for Australian Plants project very heavily utilises resources provided by Enables uh, specifically the GADI supercomputer of NCI, and that's been pivotal in all of the analysis and storage data that we've been able to do for this project. There's three main parts of this project. There's phylogenomics, which is basically building evolutionary trees as references and tools for botanists and taxonomists. And the second part is reference genomes, which I'll mostly be speaking about today. The third section is conservation genomics, which is looking at specific um, species of Australia that are un under threat. So um, the first part of the project was the Australian angiosperm tree of life, and this aimed to sequence the DNA of as many uh, Australian genera of plants that we could. Uh, Australia has one of the most diverse floras of the world and has every environmental uh, ecosystem that is uh, represented on the planet. So it's an extremely important resource and extremely important culturally and scientifically. Uh, this project is now nearing completion. We have a paper in preparation. Um, and this is working together with the Kew Gardens uh, Tree of Life, which is about to be published in Nature. And uh, as you can see, we're uh, building the Australian section of this tree of life. Um, so it's now almost complete. We have over 2,000 species in the tree. And um, this technology used a, a, a selective sequencing method of 353 angiosperm genes to build these evolutionary relationships. And it's really a, of unprecedented scale and uh, detail. Uh, so it will be an extremely useful resource for uh, taxonomy, conservation, 
um, ecosystem management and many different areas of biology. The second part uh, is the GAP reference genome project, and this, as the title suggests, is, is producing genomes for as references for a large array of different applications in plant sciences. Um, Australia, as I mentioned, has a massive diversity of plants, so the genomes that we are sequencing reflect that diversity, as you can see here. And it's involved a large collaboration of botanic gardens and universities across Australia to provide specimens which are vouchered. So that means they're very, um, they're categorized in a very detailed way. And uh, they are um, then been fed into our pipeline for uh, DNA sequencing and genome assembly using uh, NCI GAD. So the first part of this uh, reference genome project took place uh, three, three started three years ago, ended about a year ago, and this involved just seven genomes, uh, which were handled by separate teams. And an important part of that stage was the training and collaboration between these different botanists and scientists around Australia to work together for common, uh, build common tools and pipelines for genome assembly. And um, that was very successful. Uh, but for the final stage, we felt that we really needed to concentrate on having a higher throughput. And the technology has moved on as well. So that enabled us to, to do just that. So within the last year, we've now sequenced 25 genomes. And uh, that's generated a lot of, of data, as you can see. The workflow that we've used has been largely automated. There are still um, decision points within the workflow, but it's definitely something that as we move forward, we'll be able to apply to other projects and have available uh, on a, as an ABLES resource, as, as has been mentioned earlier. I won't go into the detail of every part of the pipeline, but um, we are largely using the third generation uh, sequencing of long reads. So we're using PacBio Hi-Fi and uh, Oxford Nanopore technologies for this. Um, plants can provide a lot of uh, very interested in difficult problems compared to other species. They can be highly repetitive and they can have uh, very large genomes. Um, an example of this is one of the species that we're looking at, which is Australbalia scandens, uh, which has a nine gigabase pair genome. So that's almost three uh, human genomes in size. So it provides unique challenges in terms of bioinformatics and storage. Um, but with the technology that we have, we've just recently um, finished a draft genome for that species, so it's been a great achievement. Um, we've got down to a very reasonable number of contigs. That's the um, actual assembl assemblies of, of DNA sequences. And uh, we have uh, largely uh, whole chromosomes from that as well. So there's a few, you know, there's several hundred small fragments, but we have almost complete chromosomes for the whole genome. So where we're going next with this? Well, we have a few months left on this project to, to finish off these sequences and, and publish them and make them available to the whole scientific community. So we'll be completing the, uh, a few more. Uh, we will attempt to resolve polyploids. This is one of the big problems with plant genomes compared to animals as a whole. Uh, in that they can have multiple copies of the of the genome. So within our project, we have triploids, tetraploids, hexaploids, which means they have three, four, six, and so on copies of the genome. Uh, up till now, this has been a really difficult thing to do, um, and the technology is still emerging in how to how to do that. It's certainly easier with the latest technologies of DNA sequencing, but bioinformatics remains a challenge. So that's uh, one of the big areas that we're now concentrating on. Uh, the next phase will be annotation of those genomes and uh, ident identification of uh, which contigs are full chromosome. 
Uh, as I mentioned, most we mostly have full chromosomes, which is good news. And um, yeah, so it's been a very satisfying and useful uh, experience working labels and NCI for this work. Uh, we haven't had any issues with uh, resource and um, ABLES has been very generous in providing it. So that's all uh, about the GAP project. Uh, these are just some of the uh, collaborators and sponsors of our work. So I, I will hand back to Ziad. Thank you, Theodore, and Chelsea and Hardib uh, for sharing your experience with ABLES, but also to take us through your uh, meaningful and impactful work. Now we are very proud to be supporting these projects and other projects with ABLES and see their, their, their impact. Uh, I'm sharing here some, uh, uh, some, some online resources for ABLES that includes all the details about the program, the structure, the support, and the resources that are available, and also some, some forms in case you would like to join the program and get, get access to some compute resources. But also feel free to reach out to us if you have any question and any concern, I will try to help you from there. Next part will be the questions, which I will hand it over to Melissa. Thank you, Ziad, and everyone for sharing your insights into the ABLES program and how you're using it to do some really, frankly, amazing projects across the country. We do have time now for questions and hopefully some answers too. If you have a question for our speakers, please write that into the Q&A box in your Zoom dashboard and we'll do our best to answer those for you. Perhaps I can uh, kick off with a question, probably more so for the Viacommons team than for our guest speakers. And it's, so we've heard a lot about um, people who are using ABLES, who's, who are associated with Viacommons partners. Is the ABLES program open to anyone or do you need to be a member of the partner organisations to be involved? I'm happy to respond to this one. And uh, maybe if you want to receive want to add something. So ABLES program is available for any Australian researcher. It's fully subsidized. There is no cost associated with it at all. Uh, and any Australian researcher can just reach out to us. We'll have a chat, understand more about their work, their needs, and find maybe like the suitable category for them. And uh, usually the process is, is to some extent simple and easy. The main purpose is actually to make you know, to, to make it easier for life science researchers to access the community resources and focus more on their work rather than, you know, uh, securing computer locations uh, and compute environments here and there. So it's open for anyone who is interested. Thank you, Ziad. Uh, there is a question that's come in from the audience and it is, can we share the bioinformatic workflows we are developing with ABLES to make them available to the community? Uh, yeah, I can take this one. Um, so absolutely, yes. Um, so because the number of projects are growing in number, you know, we we can't always be across everything that's being developed. But absolutely, if you have software or workflows that you want to share with the community, please do reach out to us. Um, in the case of workflows, there, there are some pretty specific platforms like Workflow Hub, um, that you can use to share your workflows. Um, but one of the things we really want to do with ABLES is provide that environment where if you're not entirely sure where to turn or what platforms to use, you can approach us and, um, and we can help. Thank you, Johan. A uh, question now for Hardip, Chelsea and Theo. It's, it sounds like you have some very impressive projects with very large amounts of data and complex uh, data analysis pipelines. What's the biggest benefit that ABLES has brought you and has, what kind of difference has it made to these programs? Um, I'm happy to stop. Um, so for us, we have limited grant funding because everything's grant funded. And so our grant funding covers every single patient just processing that data. We don't have necessary funding that allows us to do additional. So when we say that we are now reporting on, I think it's 10 different types of molecular aberrations that we see, um, 
in order to be able to do that, we have to improve our pipelines. We've got to make it quicker so we can have turnaround times of less than, you know, a couple of weeks from when the patient gets seen in the clinic because we have to do it in a clinically manageable time frame because these kids have really bad disease. That through ABLES, we're able to get the, the compute resources because we all know compute's not free, obviously. So through the compute resources and the storage, we're able to improve our pipelines. So we are constantly improving them and able to give back more data to the patient that otherwise we would have had to go out and write grants and try to get funding for, which we all know is quite limited. So they provide extra resources for us. Thanks, Chelsea. Hard up, Theo, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I can, I can add to that. I think, I think for us, uh, one of the best things about the ABLES resource and NCI GADI is um, part of the aim of, of the GAP project was um, to bring together institutes like uh, Botanic Gardens and um, uh, other smaller institutes which may or may or may not have their own compute resources, usually not. Um, and it's been very successful in that and providing that compute resource to all of these different um, places. Uh, so as well as being an important resource for storage and processing the data, it's also brought together researchers. So we have over a dozen different researchers from around the country all working simultaneously on GADI. And, uh, you know, we can um, we can help each other out. We can develop tools. We can work together. So from, from that aspect, it, that would not have happened if all of these um, participants were all separately using their own resource. So it's been very good on that side of things. Thanks, Theo. Both, <clears throat> yeah, I think both have covered uh, all the points that uh, helps OZAR community as well, which is uh, essentially bringing the community of researchers together, it's trying to tackle similar problems and uh, access to the compute resources is uh, rather than uh, us uh, going to our universities and then trying to uh, come up with some resources, but it's never scalable. So this is a place where we know we can grow uh, uh, as well. So it's really good. Thank you. It's so wonderful to hear that as well as providing you with these resources that are speeding up your data analysis, it's bringing together the community, which I think is at the heart of modern science now, really. Um, one has just popped up just as I said that. Uh, the question is, uh, the polypoi approach sounds exciting. When would that be possible and can we work together? Uh, I guess that's, I guess that's to me, <laughs> being mostly plant, plant problem. Um, yes, it is exciting. It's very challenging. Um, one challenge is the depth of sequence that you need in order to be able to separate the polyploid genomes or phase them. Um, so in the future, it'll probably mean even more data than we're generating already. But the tools to do it aren't, aren't really written yet. They're getting there. And so we're working with developers online with their tools to, to work out uh, uh, ways to do that. And GAP itself will be having a separate meeting soon to discuss it with everybody who's involved with, with GAP on uh, how we may go about doing that. So, yeah. And uh, how might people get in touch with you if they are if they are interested in collaborating? Uh, yeah, they can get in touch with me through the Botanic Gardens through my email. Yep, I will just also one quick comment as well. Yes. Uh, for the audience. So on Ables pages, we have a list of all the projects that are supported by Ables. And within within these projects, you have some details about the projects and the contact uh, uh, people for this project. So in case you are interested, you might find some project that they do something similar. And feel free if you would like, you know, to, to contact them or learn more about their work from there. It's just on the on the same link I shared with you before. So thank you, everybody. We are going to leave it there for today. As we leave, a couple of uh, things to help you keep in touch and up to date with what's happening with the BioCommons. You can follow us on X and on LinkedIn, and you can also check out our YouTube channel for recordings of previous events. You can also subscribe to the BioCommons newsletter for the latest news and events, and you can check out our website, where, which has the list of everything that's coming up in the next few months.
thanks again to all of our speakers today for sharing their insights into the ABLES program and how it is being used nationally. And thank you to all of you for joining us as well. Finally, the Australian Biocommons is enabled by NCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. But until then, goodbye for now and enjoy the rest of your day.